I am delighted to be joined by Jason Alon Butler. And we have never done an interview for Fever 333, despite having a long-standing relationship. And we'll get to music, man, because <laughs> that's what we're both all about. But it feels like at this point in human history, we've got more pressing issues before we even get to that. Um, I read your statement yeah. that you put out. And I've lived in America for three and a half years. And I've seen things before this year that really took me aback, mm. especially when it came to law enforcement. But this year has been heartbreaking. Yeah. Now, these streets are your streets, Jason. I mm. really associate you with these places. And when I listen to your record, and I know those streets now, I've been here for a couple of years... Mm. It made this summer really fucking raw, man. Mm. So what was it like to live through this summer as the person who wrote a record like that and had a record like that out there saying what it was saying? You know, it was it was interesting because a lot of people were um, were almost surprised as if there was some sort of divination or, or psychic ability in play. Um, and, and when in reality, I was I was just talking about history and. I think what it does is it provides itself as evidence of history repeating itself and all the things that we said that we would do our best to eradicate and to remove from society, it really shows that we haven't done enough and that we need to do more. And, um, you know, I think that with the album being literally like some of the scenarios I mentioned on the album, we, we watch them in real time again on television or on our screens, on our phones. And it was as if I was talking about the same uh, person in the song that we were then seeing in the future on on the screen. So we have a lot of work to do. And um, I, if anything, I think they just serve again as evidence that uh, the job is nowhere near done. Is that why you had to move to do Long Live the Innocent? Because I think that I think that it's it's the purest distillation of what Fever Three 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 is. If someone asked me what is it, I wouldn't hand them the record. I wouldn't show them a mm. video. I would go that live stream is what it's about. Did it? Did you have to do something, Jason? It wasn't just about getting your art out there. It was, I know you, man. Like, yeah. I can only imagine the emotion, and it was just about having to primarily get that out there. Yeah, that, that's, you're exactly right, Bees. The thing that happened there was um, I had a few different ideas as to how we were going to um, offer advocacy and um, aid in the scenario. And the first couple ideas, I was my biggest fear about the first ideas was like co-opting it or making it seem as though I was putting the, the music or the, the band in front of the message. So we may, you know, the first couple ideas, although there were, um, there was well intent intentions behind them. I, I, I scrapped those and was like, I think we just need to do a live stream and focus every single piece of messaging, um, energy donation chair, everything towards, the movement that is happening right now in efforts of social justice um, after being catalyzed by the murder of George Floyd. And so it happened in about, like literally we put that together in three days. I mean, flew the guys out, or flew Steven out, rehearsed a little bit, put together visuals, got the space, blocked the cameras, everything in three days um, because we had to, exactly. Like if we're gonna benefit in any way off, uh, from from being offered this platform, saying what we say, discussing what we discuss, being a part of what we're a part of, it was only it it, it was uh, inevitable. We had to do that. I I'm not a like a self-flagellating person or anything like that. It's just it's not who I am, right? But there is all kinds of unwilling ignorance mm. that I've felt. Like, I've been listening to those Kendrick records since they came out, right? Mm. And I've been listening to those words about police force and all the rest of it. And mm -hmm. it, like, when I say unwilling ignorance, it's because I think to myself, like, oh, like, things are not as bad as they were, but I don't get the chance. I, I don't get the, the right to say that, Jason. Mm. When mm. I watch what I've watched and I consume the art I consume, your art, people like that Kendrick record... Like, do you think that your words are going to be treated with an extra degree of seriousness? It's not performance art. This is a systematic fucking thing that needs to be brought to its fucking knees. Mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, 
in in uh, in having hope for the message and movement itself. I, I I hope so. Like again, this is this really this shit really ain't about me at the end of the day. Like I am just again, I am a an integral part of the the issues I discuss. Absolutely, I represent um, a demographic that is disenfranchised and mistreated. Yes, yes, yes. But me as an individual artist, this shit ain't about me at all. This is about um, the bigger conversation, every word that I speak, really. So, yeah, I hope that people take it with a a, sense, a larger dose of seriousness and uh, open-mindedness and more omnivorous into learning about what is being discussed, not for me as an artist, not for my album sales, not for streams, but for... Uh, the actual movement that that we feel needs to happen like i think the the seriousness about your statement is one of the things that i wanted to talk about um you, you've put out a, a statement that is uh that details your own roughhousing at, mm. at the hands of this shit mm -hmm. i change on a daily basis my my feelings mm. there's days where I, where i feel optimistic like good people should be fucking listening mm. and then there's days where i feel completely numb to what's going on mm -hmm. like is that something that we're all sharing as humans in this moment or have you had a level of consistency to how you felt during this like no no i think you're right i think I personally have been so up and down. I mean, there's times where I'm like crying, like just sitting there watching television and crying. And then there's times where I'm like, nah, because I see this and I feel this and this is going to change. This is, the, this is the moment. It's all going to change. And then it doesn't. And then I'm crying again. And then maybe a week later, I'm like, okay, but we're going to do this and this will change. And, you know, and then I talked to my brother, actually, who is... Um, one of the like leading law enforcement agents in his precinct. And he actually, I can say this now, he actually was going to leave because he told me that it was corrupt. He was like, this, this is, it's all, it, they're all gangsters. They're all playing and, and everybody that they're playing and, and making, and uh, making their moves on are the, are the citizens. And he actually said to me, I can't leave. I can't leave because I'm up here now. Again, he's, he's pretty high up there. He's like, I can't leave up knowing what I'd be leaving behind. So that, that's a piece of hope that I have in a very ironic sense. Like one of the greatest influences in my life is, is my brother. Absolutely. He's really helped shape who I am as a person. And he, he stands in the shape of something that I really want to dismantle. Yet he represents the only piece of that or the only uh, contour of that, that shape of structure that I want to dismantle, he shows the, the piece that I actually think is supposed to be there, which is helping people. But I don't know. I just don't know. I think you're absolutely right in how you feel, and I, and I feel the same way. Uh, it, it, like, I don't mean to use a song title at you, but like, mm -hmm. does that relationship with your brother being in the law enforcement give you a level of nuance to the burn it down rhetoric of abolish the police did it give you a bit of it ain't as simple as that yeah you know and, and that like that's the thing is i, I call every time something happens, every time me and my brother get on the phone and we talk and i always get i get a perspective from a leading law enforcement agent like i actually speak to one directly and it, it's I, to this day we are not it's not like we're all on different pages that's what's crazy is my brother is like, no, that was fucked up or we fucked up. We need to do better. Uh, we need to do better for black people, brown people, LGBTQ people. Like he, he as an LEO says this. So I don't know, man. But I, I talked to him about defunding it too. And he, again, he agrees. This, this, he goes, yes, right. we're, you know what I'm saying? He's like, we're not here. We don't want to be dealing with a lot of things and we don't get paid enough uh to to deal with everything the way which is why a lot of people fall short what's why most most uh officers will fall short is because in their mind they're not they're not uh equipped or built 
or prepared for many of these scenarios. So I think that honestly, at the end of the day, it shows itself right now, the, the burn it down theory. I, I feel like we do need to completely dismantle what we know today and restructure it and rebuild it and create a, a relationship between the people that will be serviced by whatever this new uh, idea of, of uh, protection agency is. And, uh, and also just the approach and protocol by which they, they protect people. While we're on the subject of the police and being an artist, um, I'm long since over expecting people to be who they are on record outside of it, right? Mm. But Ice Cube coming out yesterday, mm. uh, like, I'm not here to start some shit, but what, <laughs> the, but what the fuck, Jason? Mm. I don't know. I, I'm trying to. Look, I'm. Try, I'm really trying to read into it because, again, fundamentally, when he speaks about it, I. I, I get what he's saying. Uh, fundamentally, right? Where I go. Oh, oh, so you're saying you want to engage with a, an, a current administration in order to offer something to people that have been plundered for generations? That I understand, but it is sort of like I have to ask myself. Am I being reactive emotionally because of my uh, aberrant feelings like towards towards the current administration and what they've done and what they've shown and what they've exhibited to people like myself and just people that don't fit into that very uh, nominal sliver of society? I think with, with, with Ice Cube, it's like this, man. I think th- I'm just hoping that there's something in there that I don't see and I don't understand. Because he also mentioned he tried to talk to the other side of the aisle about a, a, a contract with Black America, the CWBA. And I was like, and, and he said that the Democrats actually didn't want to talk about it right now and said that we'll talk about it after the election. I, I, don't, I don't know. And this is the game that we play, right? Like in politics is, in theory, if we look at what's being said, it sounds good. I'm like, okay, cool. But what doesn't sound good is is helping the re-election process of like now. The time <laughs> is now to say this. You could you couldn't wait a fucking month and say it then. I know that's what I don't understand. That that yeah, is truly yeah. what I don't understand. And maybe that's part of the deal he had to make. I don't really yeah. know, yeah. but I, it does seem kind of fucked up. You know, it does so, seem kind of fucked up. I watched something brilliant um, that was run by Loudwire with yourself and Doc Coyle and expertly chaired by Sophie K back in the UK. Um, but what I also saw was the comments section, Jason. Right? <laughs> now, yeah. now, in metal, and I can be as guilty of this as, ev- as anyone because I, lo- I love my culture, right? Mm, heavy, mm. heavy music and yeah, yeah, the yeah. values of metal and punk rock and all these things have made me the human that I am. Mm-hmm. But I see that and I don't recognise what's looking back at me. Mm. Um, you do these things and you run a tightrope of pissing off 50% of people who would like <laughs> Fever 333. So yeah. what's, the re- what's the feelings when you see those comment sections and where's the tightrope? Because I've seen you at live shows being like, no, 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 we want the conversation with you as well if you yeah. don't listen to what we're saying. Yeah. That's a fucking hell of a tightrope. <laughs> at the best of ti- at the best of times, let alone in 2020. What's yeah. your takeaway on metal's culture and how we've dealt with this summer? It's not good enough. That's it. It's just not good enough. Um, you, you, we got to think, right? A, a couple posts, a couple interviews, a couple people putting up T-shirts to say that they helped, and that's that's that ain't shit. We're dealing with generations of um, of imbalance. You think a goddamn summer is going to change that? All of a sudden, metal and punk rock is is supremely woke, and now we've changed. That ain't shit. Wait, that ain't shit. Ain't gonna be, and that don't mean shit to me right now. That don't mean shit to my family. That don't mean shit to my friends. Like when we go home, you know what I'm saying? That like, that don't mean a damn thing. You know, it, 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 in in the moment, right? If we're if we're if we still experience, if we still ex- if we still experience the plunder from the industry that says it's 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 now aware and helping us. Um, but then it forgets about it a month later, then and now that don't mean shit. And, and so that is something that I encourage and implore, you know, all people, of course, but specifically this genre that we are a part of these and, and people that that are watching and listening is that, look, do not be offended by me saying it's not enough um, because I 
am still here as a person of color in this scene trying to change shit when I've been told I didn't belong, when I've been told that this ain't punk, this ain't metal, this ain't rock. I mean, so many times I've been told that this ain't a space or this space, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, created in a way that fits into the mold, but I'm still here. So, you know what I'm saying? If I'm still here having these tough conversations, y'all motherfuckers can hear me for a little bit and we can talk about what, what I think needs to change and we could come meet in the middle. But um, as far as that type, tightrope goes, uh, the proverbial tightrope that you were mentioning, bees, I, I just don't walk that shit no more. I, I really just kind of, I just feel like I just need to, to, to speak my truth. And then when people are willing to have civil discourse, I am very happy to engage and be a little more diplomatic or, or I, I guess not, but more understanding and open. But when I'm publicly and outward facing, now nah, I'm just going to talk about it like it is, man. Hey, how do we live together, though, man? Like, these are the people that are next to me headbanging, right? Like, like, uh, and I'm not here to fucking shit on anyone's toast about, sure, like, sure. There's, a, there's a difference between you vote in a different way to me and, sure. you lo- and you look in at my people like they're not my people. Like right, I'm, a- right. I'm, a- I'm offended at that. Like, right. but but that's fucking. That's but it's by the by, Jason. Like mm. the fucking the question uh, and the ha- the how is fucking certainly not for someone like me. I'm just a fucking dickhead that talks about riffs, mate. Like <laughs> what? You're damn good at it, though. Well, You're cheers, damn good at man. It. <laughs> cheers. But how do, how do we, uh, like, is there a way to coexist? Like, how do we fucking heal this shit within, within our own walls? Like, the world yeah. is the world, but within our own world, yeah. like, surely there's some, some middle ground for us here. Yeah, we just stop playing ourselves, bees. We just stop playing ourselves. Let's, let's stop pretending like, yo, we are all one person. We are not. We are different people. That's what we are. I'm not asking us to integrate. I don't even think that's the answer. I don't think integration is the answer. I think sharing of culture understanding, empathizing with other cultures, making sure that when you share with another culture that you don't plunder that culture, you don't take from that culture, you give back. It's an even exchange, it's, it's a, a reciprocal, it's synergistic, and, and we need to stop playing ourselves. Like, let's be okay with, with saying we have black people in rock, metal, hardcore. We have you know brown people, we have gay people, we have trans people. Let's be okay with saying that, and it's the same okay when we say, that's my white homie that headbangs with long hair in metal. Like, there, we, we, can, we, can, we can talk about our differences because if we don't, if we don't start talking about the problem first and we keep pretending like, oh, I don't see it because they listen to metal, so they're just a metalhead to me. But that don't mean shit when they leave the room, when they leave the show. You know what I'm saying? This is, so we need to start. It's like they always say, right? It starts yes, at yeah, home. Yeah, I hadn't thought Learning like starts that. at home. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, Let's, so let's, if this is our home and, and we coming into a, to a one big uh, family dinner, if, if, you know, if you want to look at shows like a family dinner and somebody brings fried chicken and somebody brings couscous and somebody brings a damn ham sandwich, you know what I'm saying? We can all have our shit together and then we can listen to whatever's being played on the radio and enjoy it together and be in that home. But let's talk to each other about these differences, how we feel, what makes us most comfortable at the table so that when we leave, we can defend and we can offer allyship to each other outside of that house. And I think we're at a time in culture as well where people don't do enough of like, it's fucking brilliant. I love hearing new perspectives always. Me too. Right? Me too. <laughs> like, like uh, it's really weird. Like uh, people give me shit for going to LA because I've moved out here. But like I listen yeah. to these meditation things and I get different perspectives yeah. all the fucking time. And Hell yeah. And that's the real shit. Um, Hell yeah. I, I, I won't even attempt to uh, further from what you just said. But I will ask is about music now. Yeah. Uh, we haven't had the chance to do this whole Fever 333 thing, <laughs> but I have seen your band since the very beginning, man. So oh, I didn't man. make... I was on a flight back from Pittsburgh, so I didn't get to make it to Randy's Donuts. Oh. But I did. <laughs> but I did go to the Roxy show that was like five bucks and was... Oh, now, now, I've been to enough label showcases in my lifetime to mm-hmm. know what was going on in that room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, my favourite bit in No Effects' book is where they talk about all the people that wanted to sign them. Now, you signed with Roadrunner Records, but that must have been a pretty wild month, six weeks period. Yeah. Or, or did you have in mind that something or how did it go? 
Nah, man, nah, not at all. Like, honestly, bro, like, and this is how, <laughs> this is how, how funny it was. I, I started um, a label to put out Fever. So I had already had a label registered. Like, I had put stuff, like, that one song that we had out before the Roxy was out on my label. Because I was like, if this pops off, I want something that, that I can bring and create my own culture. If this happens to, to do something, I want to house it under this thing. So I already had something going. I like we had friends and people working with us already. Um, and then I was like, all right, let's let's just do like a, a $5 show. Let's make it happen. And let's let's press the Roxy to make it $5. You know what I'm saying? Like whoever security wants to take a pay cut that night, pay, have them come through, whatever bartender. Like so we did a $5 show just because like I remember when shows were $5. And then next <laughs> thing I know, dude, I, I swear to you, I'm not even playing. I'm not, I didn't even know that labels were coming. I had, I genuinely had no idea. I didn't hear about like a ticket buy or anything. Yeah. I was like, I even told, uh, cause I, we had just gotten a manager. I was like, yo, like just let's see what happens. This, the show sold down three days. Like, yeah. and I, so I, I bought, bought like, a t- I bought a ticket. See, I didn't even, see? I didn't even fucking risk it. It was like $5. Yeah. That's what I mean. So it was like, it was kind of crazy. So I, I genuinely didn't even know that, um, it was going to be like that at all. So when, when people came into my dressing room, being completely honest, I wasn't even really, I wasn't even really there for that. I didn't give a yeah. fuck, to be honest, yeah. at that point. Um, but when we signed with Roadrunner, it was like this. Roadrunner is, uh, for people that don't uh, know, Roadrunner is like a subsidiary. It's underneath an umbrella of a larger label. And uh, the larger label, we kind of spoke with us. We didn't really vibe. I bounced. Some other labels spoke with. We didn't vibe. I bounced. Then the larger label that Roadrunner is under had someone come speak to me again separately a second time and uh i told that person actually i said his name is johnny minardi he's like one of the last oh, i love johnny yes he's like one of the last he truly he's one of the last ones in the game that i believe in and i'm gonna say it right here mm-hmm. and I, I could offend whoever you know yeah. if you feel offended it's probably because you ain't one of the real ones um uh but he came to me and we talked and i told him straight up i'm like hey man like y'all ain't gonna make money because basically I've, i'm registering the band as a charity uh, we want to make sure that everything goes back into either the art or the people that support the band. So at least for the f- first few years, this label ain't going to make any money. If that's what you're into, cool. Also, you can't touch the creative. You can't touch the messaging. You have nothing you can say about you know what we want to do, how we want to do it. And he went in and he stood on some, some tables and jumped on some couches to make sure that we got uh, treated and allowed into this game the way that we felt we needed to in order to further the messaging before the music. And uh, and it worked. So they allowed me to take the uh, 333 Records crew along with me and kind of have that as a shell so that we can do whatever we want underneath it. And they've been, you know, uh, it's been a good partnership thus far. So we're very lucky. I've got to ask about the relationship with John Feldman, Jason. Yeah. It's a surprising take (laughs) for me. Right. (laughs) Hear me out. Hear me out. Right. Because I, I don't, I don't want to sound like a hater here, right? No, Cause, no. Because Feldman, Feldman seems like a top man, and I've got loads of mutual friends that love him. For sure. Um, but for someone that has been au fait with your work longer than any other motherfucker, yeah, yeah. Um, I was surprised to hear someone that rounds edges rather than sharpens them. Right, right. Where did it come from to work with someone so completely out of your wheelhouse? John Feldman at the end of Let Live was the first person and consistently throughout Let Live and then at the end of Let Live who really held me down and was like, here's, I'm here for you and I'm going to give you the, he gave me all the hard truths. He kind of explained to me what he thinks, what he saw and what he could offer just as a friend before anything else. And because of that, when I was basically towards the end of let live and i was selling cookies in a damn uh, fucking super uh, supermarket yeah you know what i'm saying like he was still telling me like come over and let's talk let's figure this out let's get you right and then travis barker saw me in the store his daughter showed him my shit was like oh he's in this band He, he he went home got it or she went home showed him my shit he got in his whip came to the store and was like, what are you doing here? I was like, I'm selling cookies, bro. <laughs> then we figured we had a mutual friend, which was John Feldman. And it all, like, you were talking about meditation in LA. Like, yeah. I'm on some universal shit where I believe the universe really will um, 
afford you opportunity. So in that moment, he was like, you know John Feldman? I was like, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, we, we're kind of working together. Should we get together and write some music? I was like, for sure. And it just all offered itself and lent itself to an opportunity at that moment. So I just took it because John's been a friend of mine for I, over over a decade now, actually. So I've known John for years. Yeah. And um, he was one of the first and kind of only people at that point really willing to give me the opportunity to do this black punk rock that I was talking about, him and him and Travis. So um, I was like, you know what? On some loyalty shit, let's go. And we, of course, we've had our moments like where I'm like, I need to say it like this. I need to sound like this. I need to feel like this. And we've had to go and butt heads. Um, but at the end of the day, he always goes, it's your project, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have a different relationship, John and I, uh, both sonically and personally. Like, mm. we started, because he wanted to do some Let Live shit, and it just didn't make sense at the time. And so we started off with me yeah. and my big mouth being like, no, it's got to be like this. Right. And he's always respected it. So that's kind of how John and I have always worked, and it's how we continue to work Not now. many people say no to a man who shifts that many records as well. I know, uh, I know. Like, <laughs> so I'm, I'm delighted for you that you have more eyes and ears at this point in time because your voice has always warranted it. But I feel, you, I feel of everyone on planet Earth that gets to ask this question, it's myself. What happened with Let Live, Jason? Like, I, I, let me give you a bit of a timeline as a fan, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put out a documentary on the making of the record that felt kind of awkward and there was some weird shit. Then, yeah. then the record come out was fucking brilliant, right? Mm. I love all three Thank of you. those records every bit as much as I love each, uh, each other. Like, if Thank I had you. to say who my favourite band of the last decade were, it would be Let Live. Thank um, you. And then I saw Brixton Academy going like this to a week ago when yeah. you were playing with Pierce the Veil and it was like... This is it, man. Like this, I knew this was coming. I knew this was coming. This is it. And then touring stopped. And then rumors yeah. started. And then a statement which felt very nullifying, <laughs> if you don't mind me saying. Oh, absolutely. Now, now, what happened, man? This, man, like I, so you, I, and I know you know, like I have always been talking about the same shit um, on an emotional level, even if it was uh, even if it was politics, I talked about like the sort of emotional relationship we have with politics and what that does to affect us as people um, throughout. And I continued to do so. And then I started to distill the message. And then I really, really, um, really sort of started to embrace my, 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 you know, my, her my heritage, my culture, my blackness, and really, really put into that. Um, I felt like what I had to do as an artist was be as authentic as I always said I wanted to be in who I was then, both sonically and um, with my messaging. And at the end of it all, man, at the end of Let Live, what happened was is we wanted different things. We just did. We just wanted different things. And I feel like Let Live was supposed to be, foundationally, was supposed to be built on honesty and transparency. And if we were to continue being the band that it seemed like people thought we were at that time. And then if we had to perpetuate that, that would then become an image and wouldn't be real. It wouldn't be who, who we were together. We were all starting to believe, diverge a little bit and splinter off into different desires musically, or, you know, uh, we believed in things a little bit differently in ways that were, you know, sometimes just clashing and, it happens, so, man. It happens. It, it totally happens. And I also, I became, I was, my, Jen was pregnant. My wife was pregnant. I was the only one who was married. I was the only one who was having a kid. Like, I started looking at the future, like, thinking to myself, how do I make sure that I am as honest to myself at all times, even in my own career? And that was why, at the end, I could not ask anybody to join me in what I thought a journey that was risky and even physically could be hazardous because I was about to be saying and doing a lot of things that could cause danger. And, and, mm. and so that's kind of what happened. But, you know, as far as creatively too, man, a lot of the fever stuff, early fever stuff was just taken from what I was trying to do with, with Let Live. Right. So, Gotcha. You know, so, like yeah. a, it's a continuation of where you were going artistically, anyway. And yeah. I gotta say, man, like, at the, like 
again, don't want to seem like a hater, but like I can't That's stand the I can't stand the radio out here, Jason. Um, yeah. But when I heard your voice. Uh, like it justified everything and I can't Thanks, I'm glad that I finally get the chance to fucking say this to you thank you I wish you all the fucking successes moving forward and thank now you, now I'm here and I've got this fucking outlet we'll do this a lot more often now that I we're in contact it, again Jason appreciate you bro that's that's so real man thank you bees for I'm thank both you. ways man look at you out here killing shit for real <laughs> You, I love your city and your city seems to like me back so hell yeah I'd, I'll talk to you and I hope I hope to talk to you in a more positive manner in November. Yeah, man. Let's let's hope for it. Fingers, toes, everything crossed. Hell yeah. All the best, my friend. I'll see you soon. All right, brother. Cheers, mate. Bye. Peace. Don't forget to like and share this video and join me on Twitch every Tuesday, Friday and Saturday for guest hangouts, new music votes, tier lists, band specific competitions, weekly merch roundups and much, much more. That's twitch.tv forward slash mosh talks. Find the link in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and I'll see you on notfest.com for all of the latest news, features and much more from the worlds of rock, metal and beyond. And...